Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, glad to have you here tonight. Um, so tonight we're going to have our last last lecture of the calendar year. Um, be sure to keep an eye on the website for um, next year's offerings. We'll be back in hopefully in January. Um, tonight we're going to hear about exoplanets, and um, we're going to hear from Dr. Eckerd Spalding, who's a postdoc researcher here um, at Notre Dame. Uh, previously, he was at the University of Arizona, uh, working with the Large Binocular Telescope down there. So we're going to hear about some of his experiences and findings with that. And um, he has been with us since 2020. So um, I will let him take it over from here. If you are watching from home, uh, please just leave your questions in the chat and we'll get to address them at the end of the talk. All right, uh, can everyone hear me just fine? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to start uh, by showing a little uh, visual here. Uh, whoops. Um, um, I'm going to show a, uh, a video clip of what our, uh, this is a simulation of what our solar system uh, may have looked like some 5 billion years ago. Uh, the basic idea is just that there's a large uh, mass of gas and dust that contracts in on itself uh, by virtue of gravitation. And then there's something called angular momentum that causes it, uh, as it spins, to flatten out into this disk-like shape. And then there are these little tadpole-shaped uh, objects within that stuff. Uh, that are the localized regions where stuff is collapsing in on itself, and those are the nuclei of forming planets. So keep this uh, uh, dusty disk-like picture in mind. Um, now I will, I will switch and show you a visual of all the uh, locations of all the exoplanets that are known to us today. Uh, this is a nice little uh, uh, applet that, whoa, I don't need the, the music. Uh, Okay, so NASA is playing some music here that, that is not necessary, uh, but um, I'll, just, I'll just show you how the uh, 3D distribution of exoplanets, which numbers more than 4,500 known exoplanets, is arranged around the sun. I can zoom out. You can see how many light years away we are from Earth. And there's a, there's a jet. Oh, I see. No. Oh. Pardon that. There's a jet of exoplanets going off in a particular direction, which is uh, the result of planets that were discovered by a particular mission that just stared at a single location in the sky. That was the Kepler mission. And it, it just stared in that, at that location for a few years. Um, and uh, those are the planets that come from that data set. There are other techniques and other facilities that have found other exoplanets that if I, if I zoom in closer to our sun appear more evenly distributed and uh, one nice feature of this uh, is that I can click on these and then zoom in on that particular, uh, that particular system and it plots uh, the orbit. It's kind of hard to see here, but it plots the orbit of the known exoplanets in that system along with a greenish sort of disk. Uh, if you can see that there, it's, again, it's, it's kind of dim here, but there's a green disk that I can rotate around. That's the habitable zone. So that is, that is the set of distances around that star where um, an Earth-sized planet with an atmosphere the thickness that of the Earth's uh, would be expected to be able to uh, uh, host liquid water on its surface, which, as far as we know, is an essential component for life. Okay, so uh, keep those, uh, those uh, pictures in mind. Now... Uh, the University of Notre Dame is going to become involved in uh, exoplanet hunting here very shortly. Uh, this is an instrument called the Gemini Planet Imager uh, that is hooked up to the back of a telescope uh, down in Chile in South America. Uh, this is an instrument that is designed to directly image exoplanets. Uh, this is a technique that is very uh, useful for a number of reasons. And um, here's an image of an exoplanet that it discovered uh, while doing a survey down in Chile. Uh, this is the exoplanet 51 Airy B. It's a very massive planet. Um, it's a few times the mass of Jupiter. It has about roughly the same volume as that of Jupiter, and it's well outside of its habitable zone. Uh, but this was a unique discovery, and uh, here are the proud members of, of uh, some of the team that was involved 
including one uh, Jeff Chilcote, who is a professor of physics here in, at Notre Dame. In the coming months, uh, that instrument is going to uh, be shipped northwards uh, to Notre Dame. It's going to be housed in the basement of the Newland uh, 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 Science Building, and then will be refurbished and made more sensitive so as to move it out, move it out to uh, Hawaii, where it's going to take another more sensitive survey uh, from an almost identical telescope up on Mount Ikea. Now, as, as time goes on, though, we want to be able to uh, detect and characterize exoplanets that are substantially uh, less massive than Jupiter. We want to push down the sensitivities even further so that we can really discover um, planets that potentially have rocky surfaces and could even host life. One thing that's really remarkable about the day and age that we live in is that we can actually calculate a quantity called eta Earth. Eta is a Greek letter. Uh, maybe a COVID variant will be, uh, will be called eta, but don't confuse a COVID eta with this eta. Uh, this is the number of Earth-sized planets in habitable zones around stars. Um, this is a value from a recent study, this 0.34, um, that has some margin of error, but it's a number that we can calculate based on the data that came primarily from uh, the Kepler spacecraft, which I mentioned to you at the beginning. And it's really amazing that we can actually calculate this number um, and it's certainly higher than zero. But what we know of the atmospheres of Earth-sized exoplanets is actually embarrassingly paltry. Uh, we, don't, we, we haven't directly measured all that much of the atmospheres of possible other Earths out there, and we need to be able to study those atmospheres if we want to quantify whether there's um, any possibility for a biosignature, something that's giving off gases like methane, carbon dioxide, oxygen, things like that. And we need to be able to do that if we can say whether or not we're alone in this universe. This slide pretty much shows you uh, most of what we have been able to directly determine of other atmospheres of Earth-sized planets out there. Uh, there's this one character, 55 Cancri E, uh, where we know that there is an atmosphere because of the way that heat is redistributed around that planet, but we don't know what's in that atmosphere. There's another body called LHS 3844b, where we're pretty sure there's no atmosphere. It's just this rocky ball. There's another character, GJ 1132b, where uh, it may have an atmosphere, but if so, it's smoggy. And then there's a collection of, of remarkable uh, Earth-sized exoplanets that's very fortuitously positioned uh, in the sky called the TRAPPIST-1 system. And it has at least a few planets whose atmospheres appear not to be hydrogen dominated if we compare the data with models. That's it. That's, that is most of what we know about the atmospheres of Earth-sized exoplanets out there, or that's most of what we've been able to measure. Uh, there's a lot of theory and modeling that goes into what we might expect, but this is what we actually know so far. Now, to get down to the level of sensitivity where we're actually directly studying atmospheres of other exo-Earths, we need to go to space. Uh, we need to get above the Earth's atmosphere, which injects a lot of noise into those observations. But there is an obstacle that may be standing in our way, possibly an insurmountable obstacle. Has anyone ever seen uh, a, 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 a cone of light uh, that's in the night sky? In this picture, it's kind of slanted at this angle. Uh, you might see it shortly before dawn or shortly after dusk. Has anyone ever seen that light? No? One, one person has? Here's another picture where it's a little bit more apparent. Does anyone know what this light is called? It's not light pollution. Oh, what's that? Zodiacal. Yes, yes, very good. It's called zodiacal light. This is not the Milky Way. This is zodiacal light, which has a very different nature from that of the Milky Way. Um, in fact, uh, here's an all-sky image uh, that I took off a, a weather camera uh, up at, at a, a telescope, where it so happened that one night we could actually see the Milky Way, which is this thing right here. Again, it's sort of dim in this picture, but this is the Milky Way. And then there's this cone of light at an angle of about 60 degrees to the Milky Way. And this stuff here is zodiacal light. Zodiacal light is light that has, been, that has been scattered to us and re-emitted to us from dust particles that sit in the plane of our solar system. And there's this difference of about 60 degrees with the Milky Way because our solar system is actually tilted relative to the plane of the Milky Way. 
Here's a representation of that dust. It, it mostly is located between the orbits of uh, Mercury and Jupiter. Uh, remember that dusty image, that, that uh, dusty uh, YouTube video that I showed you at the beginning. Um, a lot of this dust appears to be replenished, uh, so it's not all primordial, uh, but it's this uh, sort of puffy dust in our system that produces this light at the right time of day that, so that we can observe it from the Earth's surface. Um, by the way, one of the people who has professionally studied zodiacal dust is uh, Brian May. Uh, he's the guitarist of the legendary rock band Queen. He turned in his PhD thesis in 2007 and was able to graduate 37 years after he started his PhD program. So uh, zodiacal, lust, uh, zodiacal dust attracts interesting people. Why is zodiacal dust important? If we want to study other Earth-like planets out there and study solar systems that are other than our own, why do we care about zodiacal light? If you imagine that we zoom out from our solar system, you would see something like this. If you were to successfully block out the light from the, from the sun, you would just leave this black spot there. And you would see something like a big outer belt of debris. This is sort of Kuiper belt stuff. This is really old primordial stuff at the outer fringes of our solar system. And then there are these gas giants here. And then way down at the middle, hugging our sun would be this glow that's a mixture of zodiacal light and the Earth, uh, Venus, Mercury, um, everything in the inner solar system. And it's all kind of just mixed together. This is that picture of 51 Airy B that I showed you that was taken by this other instrument um, uh, down in uh, Chile that's gonna be coming up to Notre Dame. Um, if you imagine that I inject a light source from a diffuse kind of background source that's inside the system, let's see what happens to this picture. Um, here's some more noise, here's some more noise. And if the, the dust in that system is really thick, it might look something like this in which case it's not even necessarily the case that we can detect there's a planet at all. And even if there is, the data that we get from it, if we can identify that planet, may not be useful to us anymore because it's just so noisy. Um, here's a, a spectrum of that planet. This is real data now, um, where these data, uh, this is a plot of brightness as a function of wavelength, where these data points here that kind of go up and down, and then there's a gap and then it goes up and down again, um, these are data points uh, that indicate to us that there is uh, methane in the atmosphere of that exoplanet. Under circumstances, methane could be a biosignature, um, not just by itself, but it has to be in combination with some other gases. Um, and it's, it's almost certainly not a sign of life on this planet because the planet is too massive and it's way outside of its habitable zone. So this is probably being produced abiotically. But nevertheless, this is a good test case um, that lets us know like, uh, how, how we can actually determine that there are gases that could be important for life. But if there's a bunch of noise in that image, then it, it's kind of useless. We would just see a very noisy spectrum and, and not really be able to put any hard constraints on the gases in those atmospheres. So it turns out that if you go through the map, the amount of time that is required to observe an exo-Earth system to detect an exo-Earth in another star system and potentially take useful data from it, um, that time, and this is assuming a space-based facility above the Earth's atmosphere, that time is proportional to, and we want this to be as efficient as possible, uh, this thing is, uh, means proportional to, it's proportional to residual starlight. So that's light from that other star that leaks through the system that you haven't managed to block out. And that will depend on the instrument, but we can quantify it. We can put constraints on it and calculate exact, uh, approximately what we would expect. Plus the noise from zodiacal light, that's the stuff in our own solar system. But this too is known. We can easily measure it. That's just a term that you add in there and you just keep doing the math. But then there's this one last term that we really don't have a handle on at all. And that's the light from exozodiacal light. Whatever that counterpart is in that other solar system of our own zodiacal light is going to be adding noise, but we really don't know how much. So this is just a big set of question marks. Um, and I'm gonna call exozodiacal dust disks for short, just exozodes. I'll just call them exozodes. Uh, Space-based missions uh, to, to continue to do science and to push the frontiers of what we know are always going to become more and more expensive, larger and more ambitious, and require more and more development time as time goes on. 
This is the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, if I keep my fingers crossed, it's going to launch on December 22nd so far. Uh, uh, let's hope there's no uh, additional delay. And here's a picture just to give you a sense of scale. Uh, these are technicians with the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, sunshade. And this mission cost a total of about $10 billion uh, to develop and about tw uh, two decades of research and development. And um, it's going to be able to do uh, some important things with exoplanet science. But in order to really investigate other exo-Earths, we have to make even larger missions. So they could potentially cost more. They could potentially take more time. And in order to justify all that to the American public, to the European public, to Congress, to funding agencies, we have to be able to say how much noise we would expect from exozodes so that we can say we're going to push the frontier of knowledge this far. So there is a possibility, however, that if exozodes are bright enough, that the mission to understand other Earth-like worlds in the universe is just impossible. It may be impossible if exozodes are too bright. And that's a very bleak prospect because it's one of the most important things or one of the most profound questions we can ask ourselves. Are we actually alone? What's the nature of other worlds out there? Is there life on other planets? But if we can already do the math and figure out, wait, we, we actually cannot do this. This is an insurmountable obstacle. Then that's, that is a very bleak prospect indeed. So let's figure out that last noise term. We need to find what this number is. Okay. It's downtime at the Notre Dame Stadium. Imagine that you are standing beyond the 50 yard line. And if you look closely, you might see an individual standing under the goalpost right there. Imagine that individual plucks a hair out of their head and holds it up. If you have eyes that can resolve that hair, that is the resolution that you need in order to actually image an exozodi and separate it from the light from its host star. We're also faced, if we want to uh, uh, figure out how bright exozodes are, we're also faced with what's called the lighthouse effect. We have to somehow block out the light from the host star, which could be many, many times brighter than anything around it, like an exoplanet or an exozodi. So it's kind of like trying to make out a firefly next to a lighthouse. Somehow we have to blot out that lighthouse light. So how do we do that? Okay. There is a telescope on a mountaintop in Southern Arizona, a mountain called Mount Graham, uh, that has this very unique binocular construction. It has two eight and a half meter wide telescopes that are on a single mount. And in principle, you could combine the light from both telescopes together and get added resolution. It's sort of like if, if you look at a scene with one eye and you keep the other eye closed and then you switch eyes, you, you see how the scene slightly changes. That's kind of the same, uh, that's, that's analogous to how you get that extra resolution by using telescopes that are separate and then combining that light. That's how you stand a chance of making out that hair that that person underneath the goalposts is holding up. So let's go to Southern Arizona, uh, to a lovely uh, Tucson in the middle of the Sonora Desert. And uh, the University of Arizona campus is in, is in town uh, just below just below the bleachers of their stadium is a mirror lab. Um, and it uses an innovative mirror casting technique that was figured out by a faculty member in this department uh, back in the 80s. A mirror casting technique that involves melting glass in a spinning oven. And um, it, it spins for a really long period of time. And that produces the largest uh, single piece mirrors available before, uh, ever before and today uh, for telescopes. And they're used in both civilian and also in at least one case, a uh, mysterious uh, Defense Department uh, application. So uh, this mirror lab uh, below the bleachers of the University of Arizona Stadium literally churns out these giant mirrors. You can take a tour of the place uh, if you're, you're ever down there and the pandemic allows it. And it was these mirrors that were lugged up uh, uh, Mount Graham uh, in this very precarious kind of style and were finally installed at the LBT um, around, I think it had both eyes in 2012. It was a long process before it actually uh, got to that point. 
Um, up on this mountaintop, which you can also take a tour of if you like, there are three telescopes up on that mountaintop. Um, and here at a, at a university with a Catholic identity, I would be remiss not to mention that the Vatican actually owns and operates one of those telescopes. Uh, it's the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope. Um, and there are priests who are also trained as professional astronomers who take data from there and do science. Um, and there are some other people from other institutions that also um, uh, uh, take data from there, including in the past, some people from the physics department here. So you get to tour that uh, if you book a tour um, through the Eastern Arizona uh, College website. Okay, so here in the chamber of the LBT, uh, this is from a few years ago before it got crowded with instruments. Um, and it's run by a private consortium that Notre Dame has a slice of. And uh, this is another view a little bit later when some more instruments were installed. This is a view from above where I'm looking down on those two giant mirrors. And the instrument that's going to combine the light from both telescopes is the thing in that green border right there. It's called the interferometer instrument because two beams of light are being interfered with each other to get that extra resolution. Um, here's another zoom out. Um, you can't see them in this picture. They're not here. But if you, uh, if you imagine where those white ovals are, uh, there's another set of mirrors there. And what those mirrors do is they remove the twinkling effect of a star in the night sky. So when we look at a star through the atmosphere, um, that, that ray of light that's coming to us is getting aberrated by the atmosphere in this uh, uh, very uh, rapid way. And that's what causes stars to twinkle. But to take really precise, high-resolution um, imaging, um, it's not going to do much good if we combine those light beams uh, across two telescopes if we cannot remove that twinkling in the first place. And so for that, we use a technology called adaptive optics. Um, so if, if you imagine we look at where that, uh, those white ovals were, uh, this is what one of those mirrors looks like. It takes the light from the giant primary mirror and then focuses it down before it goes into the instrument. And this mirror basically aberrates itself it puts patterns uh, into the mirror at a rate of hundreds or even thousands of times a second. Um, and, um, excuse me, <laughs> and cancels out uh, the twinkling effect of the, uh, uh, of the star. Um, here's another shot. Um, the uh, a company that makes uh, these mirrors is called Archetri. Um, it's an Italian company. Um, you can see uh, uh, these are magnets on the rear of the mirror. And what happens is there are voice coils of wire and there are currents that get run through them that actually moves these magnets up and down. And so this is with adaptive optics off. This is with adaptive optics on. So this is an image of a star with a smaller star right next to it. We would not be able to see that if we were just looking at this. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, Archetri, the Italian company that makes these, is also involved in making the uh, precise uh, timing electronics for uh, falconry competitions in the Middle East. Uh, the birds actually hold uh, these little timers uh, on their feet, and then they fly some distance, and then the amount of time that it takes is, is taken very seriously and measured as precisely as possible. Um, and so uh, this company had the right experience for the right uh, electronics, and so they get contracted to them as well. Okay, so here we're at the University of Arizona campus. Um, this is the actual box that contains the detectors. So it's gonna collect all the light at the end of the process. And uh, it's, it can be upgraded and, and messed around within the lab on campus and then gets shipped up when the season is right to the mountaintop. And uh, this was always a very early morning process. Here we're shoving it into a freight elevator and now it's going into uh, a van and off we go. Uh, driving east of town. It's about, it's a lovely hour and a half drive. Uh, you see some uh, beautiful views of the Sonora Desert and uh, some of the uh, mountains, possibly with snow on, on their peaks. And then here we go, driving up the mountain. Uh, this is on another trip when uh, we were not using a van, but we were using a pickup. And sometimes we run into snow. Uh, I, I do, I have had the experience of crunching into a guardrail. Um, and, uh, but if you make it safely to the top, uh, this is what it looks like in the high bay. And the only way to get that instrument into the chamber of the telescope is to literally just crane it into place. And it's this very precarious, uh, very sort of white knuckle operation, very slow, very deliberate. And uh, I'm, I'm full of praise for the staff at this observatory. 
Um, and uh, then when finally it's, it's attached, long story short, all the bolts are tightened, everything is in place, the instrument is right there. All right, so the, so the light comes in from both telescopes up here, gets directed down here, and this is where they're combined and where the detectors do their work. Now, you might remember, say, from a, like a college lab, if you interfere two beams of light together from like uh, lasers, uh, you see this interference pattern of bright and dark fringes. And that's the same kind of principle that we use here. If, if you imagine that this object is an exozoty, this is a simulation projected onto the sky, when we interfere the two beams of light from both telescopes together, we create a transmission fringe pattern where we arrange it so that there's a dark fringe that goes right over the host star and cancels out the host star's light. And then stuff can leak through these bright fringes if it's not coming directly from the star. So if it's a little bit off axis, if it's stuff that's around the star, it can actually slip through. Then what ends up on the detector in the end is a dot of light that consists of light from anything other than the star, which is kind of weird. So just to rehearse, the object we want to image is mostly the star's light. It's way brighter than the exozody, way brighter than any planets in that system. And we want to get rid of that stuff. So we feed it through a transmission pattern, and then we're left with stuff that is anything but the star. Now, the, the targets uh, that were, uh, or the target list that was populated for doing a survey to try to statistically constrain um, the way in which exozodes behave or how they manifest themselves, uh, this was really brainstormed by Alicia Weinberger. Uh, she's at Carnegie. She did all the thinking behind uh, the precise scientific justifications for choosing the exact stars that we're interested in in our own solar neighborhood. Um, and she came up with these targets that are within a cube that's about 200 light years across on each edge. And uh, these, uh, these were very carefully chosen. And these blue ones um, are stars that were chosen because they're very similar to our own star or our own sun. So when everything is actually running, uh, this is what one bank of the, uh, the control room looks like. This is just one wall. There are many different things going on. So you have light coming through two different telescopes. Both of them have adaptive optic systems to remove the twinkling of, of, the, uh, of the star. Then the light has to get delicately combined together. You have to arrange the fringe pattern just right to allow only exozodiacal lust, dust through, and the detectors have to be working and so on and so forth. And, and there are all kinds of things that could go wrong. Um, in fact, uh, if a cloud just comes through, it ruins everything. But even if the weather is perfect, there's all kinds of opportunity for other things to go wrong as well. But this survey, which was carried out from, uh, in terms of active science observations, uh, took place from 2014 to 2018, uh, and it was the host survey, so the hunt for observable signatures of terrestrial systems. And even though these science observations lasted four years, there was a lot of research and development that had to go on uh, uh, before then, um, roughly 20 years. Uh, this is uh, Phil Hintz. He's the uh, He's the person who actually started working on prototypes of this instrument when he was a graduate student uh, back in 1996. Uh, so he's been with this project since the very beginning. What he's observing here is uh, the, uh, the combination of the beams of light from both telescopes, and he's trying to make sure that nothing goes wrong. If you look closely, you can kind of see a fringe pattern there. Uh, this is Steve Vertel. Uh, he was a, a postdoc in the group. Um, here he is proudly crossing off uh, a target uh, from a whiteboard. Um, the criterion for success as imposed by NASA on us was to observe 35 stars, just 35. It doesn't sound like a lot, but to do the science observations for that, it, it took four years. Um, you're sharing the telescope with other groups, of course, and there's all kinds of overhead and things that can go wrong. And so the, there's, it costs a lot of time, but if you can get 35 stars, um, that's, that's what, what, what constitutes success according to NASA. So it's always a big deal when there's like one target that we get through. And so here he's happily uh, crossing off one of those on the, on the board. At the end of each night, um, it's, you know, all these observations are very aerobic. There's, there's stuff going on all the time. It always demands your attention, always things changing, things to watch out for, things going wrong. And so by the end of the night, people are pretty haggard and you can kind of see that in Phil's face here. Um, and uh, this is just shortly before sunrise. Um, so, uh, so everybody is tired just before sunrise. 
Now, when all the data gets analyzed, uh, this is a plot corresponding to one of those 30, uh, 35 stars. They turned out to be 38 in, in total. We got a few more. Um, but this is a plot corresponding to one of those stars where this is brightness here. And then this is time. That's the fraction of the day. Uh, and uh, just in terms of a decimal number. And when we take these observations, we have to look first at what's called a calibrator star. So that's what this cal means right here, where we try to get a baseline on if this is a star where there's no exozody that's expected to be visible, it's a star that's so far away, you, we would just not make anything out. We need to be able to get a baseline on the amount of contamination that does get through that fringe pattern. And so we observe a calibrator star first, then we go to a science star. In this case, it's a star called Beta Uma. And then we go back to a calibrator star, and it's a different calibrator star, just in case you know, the, the, we had wrong assumptions about the first one. And then we go back to the science star, and then we go back to another calibrator star. And you can see the calibrator stars have this very consistent brightness. And yet there's this offset here that the science star has relative to those. And it's that offset that indicates that there is a glow coming from habitable zone dust in that system around that star. When all the data for all the stars gets put together onto a single plot, this, is a, uh, this axis here is the zodi level. So it's like saying how thick the exozodi is in that system. And then this is the age of the system in terms of billions of years. It's, it's interesting to see if there are correlations that start to emerge uh, with relative to age. So this is a sensible uh, plot to make. And up at the very top, of course, are these really dusty systems. You can see these are at 600 zodis, 600 times the, the thickness of the zodiacal dust in our own system. And there's this one guy here that's way up at 1950. It's literally off the charts. So this is a, these are very freakishly dusty systems. Then the question is, what is it like just below that? And it turns out there's this gap right here. And then most systems, tend to lie down here, somewhere in like the range of like 200 or below. Uh, these filled in data points are stars where there was a detection of an exozodi, um, uh, but it just wasn't that much. And then these hollow data points are non-detections to within the margin of error. And so fortunately for us, these stars down here appear to be more common. Uh, systems appear to be less dusty than had been feared. At the end of the survey, in, in the final analysis of, of the science, out of 38 stars that were observed, 10 of them had detected exozodes. And a typical level, based on some modeling and some more math, it turns out that it, uh, on a level that you can expect from stars is about three zodies. There is a margin of error there, but it's still low enough uh, that this is a, this is a, a comfortable number uh, to, to uh, come up with, because it means that nearby stars are not prohibitively dusty for doing future exo-Earth imaging. So put pictorially, uh, the results say that uh, if we're looking at, a, at an extrasolar system that's, that's got these planets here that are embedded in, in zodiacal dust, um, this is more common and not this. So when you reach the criterion for success, of course you have to celebrate. And uh, this is uh, Phil Hintz uh, opening up a champagne bottle and doing some damage to a light fixture. And what I can't capture in this picture is how maniacally he was laughing as I took this picture, uh, but it's, uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. So somewhere out there over the rainbow exists an alien landscape that may look something like this. This is just an illustration, but of all the possibilities that are out there, uh, it's almost certain that somewhere there's an alien landscape that looks like this. And in its night sky is an exozodi. But fortunately for us, those exozodes are typically not that dusty, and we can actually do exo-Earth science if we so choose. At this very moment, there is a space mission called TESS. It's in orbit around the Earth, and it's flagging uh, detections of planets around nearby bright stars that are very well placed for um, very detailed follow-up using other facilities later on. Um, for example, there is the James Webb Space Telescope launching just in a matter of a few days, and it will be able to go a long way in uh, characterizing the atmospheres of exoplanets that are maybe um, gas giants or Neptune-sized or even sub-Neptune-sized, 
And there may be uh, an instance of like one Earth-like planet, if it's well positioned uh, relative to our line of sight, that it will really be able to do uh, some atmospheric characterization of. Um, there are other uh, ambitious uh, projects on the, uh, uh, in, uh, in development right now. Uh, the GMT telescope is a telescope uh, in construction down in Chile, in South America. Uh, there is the TMT uh, that's going to be built either in Hawaii or in the Canary Islands. Uh, that's still unknown. And these giant telescopes are going to start coming online in the late 2020s. Um, the Europeans are going to build an even larger telescope, the EELT, or the European Extremely Large Telescope, with a diameter of about 40 meters across the main mirror. And these telescopes will be able to characterize the atmospheres of, um, of uh, possibly Earth-sized exoplanets around a particular type of star called M dwarfs. These are stars that are smaller and dimmer uh, than our own sun, and possibly also start to look for some biosignatures in their atmospheres. Um, there are other space-based missions that are in, uh, also in development. There's this one idea called HABEX that might use um, what's called a star shade floating out in space uh, uh, tens of thousands of kilometers away to block out the light from the host star so that we can image planets around it. And HABEX uh, will be able to characterize the atmospheres of, uh, of uh, a handful of Earth-sized exoplanets out there. Um, a European group is designing this thing called LIFE, which uses this beam combination technique from different telescopes, but now it's in space, and it will be able to discover possibly hundreds of terrestrial-sized exoplanets, and then later do some follow-up on maybe a few uh, dozen of those that are in the habitable zones of those stars. And uh, maybe the biggest of all is this mission called LUVOIR. Uh, there are a few different versions of this uh, uh, mission on paper right now, but it, among uh, uh, other things, got a big endorsement uh, from a group of astronomers uh, just a few weeks ago that will have a lot of influence on uh, federal budget allocations. So the future looks pretty bright for a mission like LUVAR that is going to be able to um, uh, study in detail the atmospheres of exoplanets the size of Earth and, and also look for biosignatures. It's going to take a lot of observing time, uh, but it is something that it will be able to do. Now, uh, this is that, that spectrum of that planet 51 Airy B that I showed you at the beginning that indicated that there was a presence of methane in here. Um, this is a simulated image of what the Earth would look like at a distance of uh, several parsecs away that Louvoir would be able to observe. Okay, so this is a simulated image using uh, a certain amount of observing time where you can very clearly see that there's uh, ozone, diatomic oxygen, water, carbon dioxide, um, and other stuff that in combination would be very, very good evidence for there being life on this planet. And so this is something that in principle uh, we could see uh, through the atmospheres of other planets when Louvoir launches. So uh, this question that we, that we kind of, uh, that, that we posed to ourselves towards the beginning can we actually study other exo-Earths out there? And there was this real possibility that we actually cannot do that, or at least not in any uh, useful or feasible or justifiable way. It turns out that that is actually a mission that is possible in the coming years and decades. And so with that very heartening thought, I will uh, stop and take any questions. <laughs>